design unleashes the power of human creativity and imagination. It is a world of wonder and possibility that constantly invents and innovates the things we use in our day-to-day -day lives. But the role of design in today's world does not have to stop at creating new or better products. Design can play a more vital role in ushering in economic and social change to a country. Designers around the world are looking at ways to use design to lessen human impact on the environment, revive traditional methods of production, and empower communities that are marginalized in society. The Academy of Design pioneered design education in Sri Lanka, setting a platform for the country's youth to learn design at a professional level, which is on par with the rest of the world. For over a decade, it has geared young designers to take Sri Lanka's creative industries to a new level by incorporating the country's cultural diversity, artistic legacy, and its rich base of natural resources. Now as Sri Lanka emerges in the aftermath of a three-decade conflict, the Academy's efforts to contribute to the development agenda of the country have taken on a whole new dimension. We are in a post-conflict uh, situation, we have a fresh start to rebuild the country, uh, and I think as the pioneer in design school in Sri Lanka, we almost have a duty to do our bit, I think, for our country because like, we are a generation who grew up with the war and all of that. Sri Lanka is awakening after a three-decade war. For people who lived in the war zone, peace is ushering in new hope and optimism. The Academy of Design is trying to share its knowledge and expertise with these communities in order to help them rebuild their lives. In this remote village far north of Sri Lanka, a team of designers from the academy are working with a local artisan community to look at ways to develop their craft-based products. By blending traditional skills with contemporary design knowledge, they hope to add more value to the artisan's work and help them find new market opportunities. They have the skills to create things that people want, but they simply don't have the knowledge and understanding of those people to n know what to, what to make for them. And that's sort of the, the role that design is playing in this. Based on contemporary trends, it's creating market-led market avenues in places that they've never tried to sell these things before. You can, you can, you can weave a stick. Right now we're working in five districts, uh, Mena, Mulativu, uh, Jaffna, Ampara, and Batiklo district. We have chosen those because that required our immediate intervention. Plus, all these districts had something to offer before the conflict. Here in Mana, in the northwest of Sri Lanka, another community is developing crafts made from the Palmyra palm. Most artisans involved in the project were directly affected by the war. It destroyed their homes, disrupted their way of life, and took away their loved ones. Today, they work in handicraft centers set up by the government to restore livelihoods and revive some of the traditional crafts that existed in the region. There were already a lot of aid agencies, a lot of government bodies doing work in the north and east. We felt that we can fit in once they set up. For example, they set up a handloom weaving center with the necessary equipment, but they don't have the capacity to take it forward. If not, what we found is in the north and east, there's a huge trend, start, stop, start, stop, 
nobody is there to take forward what he started. Designers involved in the project feel that the inherited artistic and cultural traditions of the artisans have the potential to make their products unique and authentic in the market. This is the country that can make the difference in many different things. You're coming out of a war, there's so many things that have happened. Time has stood still in this country and it's good in lots of ways because in other countries it ran away and many of the artisan skills have now become redundant or they've decided to use materials that make them just not very interesting to buy. All these districts had something to offer before the conflict. Now Batikla was known for its uh, handloom, the famous Batikla sarong. That's part of the whole heritage of Sri Lanka if you like, you know. So basically we've tried as much as possible to stick with the traditional craft. So Batiklo for handloom weaving, Jaffna for Palmyra. We've chosen a starting point uh, and also looked at easy accessibility to raw materials. The key challenge for designers on the project was to find ways to inspire the artisans to innovate their product while keeping its traditional elements intact. The average person that we're working with on this project never really thinks about selling anything past the end of the road. You're sort of building for them a, a bridge that connects their skills with markets that badly need those skills. The Manar district is located in the northwest of Sri Lanka. Historically, it played a major role as a trading port for early settlers on the island. In colonial times, it was renowned for its pearl fishery, which attracted the Portuguese, the Dutch and the British. During the conflict, Manar suffered from isolation. Low rainfall, high temperatures and the seasonal nature of employment make life a daily struggle for the people of the area. Located on the northernmost tip of the island, the Jaffna Peninsula has played a vital role in Sri Lanka's history. Its close proximity to major sea routes in the Indian Ocean made it a highly contested region, with imperial powers from both India and the West vying for its control. During classical antiquity, Jaffna was a thriving maritime trading centre, and by medieval times, it became the seat of what is known as the Arya Chakravarti Kingdom. Though it has seen through centuries of warfare and destruction, Jaffna's cultural heritage and ancient grandeur is still very much alive in her people. In both Mana and Jaffna, Palmyra leaf workers have been carrying on their craft for years. Palmyra palms are found almost everywhere in the region and the tender leaf used for the craft is available all year round. In ancient times, the Palmyra palm was called Katpaham, or the wish-giving tree, and had over 800 uses. Even today, the tree provides several products of economic value, made from its pulp, sap, leaf, fiber and timber. The processed leaf used for weaving was also used as writing material in the past. Located towards the northeast of the island, Muletivu saw some of the heaviest fighting during the last phase of the war. Much of the district still remains barely populated. Former settlements have been swallowed up by jungle, making them hard to access by road. The scale of devastation has left visible marks on both the landscape and the people. Ampara and Bataklo districts are well known for their handloom and mat weaving industries. Handloom is one of the oldest traditional crafts on the island. In the past, cloth served a decorative as well as a functional purpose. Class and creed were often symbolized by the different types of drapes worn by the people. According to the historical chronicle the Mahavamsa, Indigenous communities of the island spun cotton yarn even before early settlers arrived here in the 3rd century BC. Mat weaving is done in many parts of the island using a variety of materials such as fibre, reeds and palm leaves. Batiklo 
is known for mats made of a variety of rush and reed known as ole. Setting a rush and reed bed in a small plot of a paddy field has been an age-old custom of local farmers. The hand-woven mat plays a big role in the social and cultural life of a village and is often used in marriage rites and religious ceremonies of all communities. If you're really going to help them, you need an international market, you need big volumes uh, to, to make a difference for that kind of big numbers of people. Right? So therefore, we have engaged our international faculty, our international network of designers, our connections out there to bring in that bit. We went out to every village we're going to work with. We sat with them and talked about what you can do and understood the process chain of everything they do do and said, okay, these are the skills they have to offer. This is what they can do. And then we took that back and as designers we sat down and said, what could I make using these skills where there is a chance for sale to a different demography? What we've done is in all these projects we haven't just aimlessly designed. The products of these people are designing and developing are basically with already retailer buy-in. So therefore there's an immediate commitment that this will translate into orders. We did survey of this year's trends, what people are using contemporarily, both in Sri Lanka's higher demographic markets, um, boutique hotels, big custom architecture pieces, and what's this year's sort of houseware and fashion trends worldwide. And we tried to design items that fall within those aesthetics that are very saleable, but also, from the village context, makeable. Maybe not at the moment we started easily makeable because we had to decide how can we teach them things that are going to enhance their ability to make valuable objects? In the mat weaving and Palmyra industries, for some reason, the only colors they ever used were this green and this magenta. And we went to 20 villages, and in every village they only used two colors. So the people we put in the villages to teach and work with them, the first thing they started attacking was color. And they said, how do we get a broader range of color? And we used everything they had locally, and we started looking at what they could buy in Sri Lanka, but just don't. We also attacked scale. You know, everything was about this big. And we said, well, what if we made things that were very large? What if we tried combinations of things that linked together? What if we made sets of multiple objects? What if we used different weaves interlocking in different ways? How will that patterning change the way the object looks? Mulitiv, we've gone in a non-traditional area. Practically the entire Mulitiv was destroyed. You have to almost look at uh, the urgency of restoring a livelihood there and look at the easiest livelihood that you can restore very quickly. Knitting is a, is, a, is a pretty quick learning curve skill. So the people that we saw in it have picked it up very quickly. But it's fascinating because it's not going to come from here and probably very little of it will ever be sold here. It's, it's a complete import raw materials, export finished goods situation, which economically speaking is a classic. It's interesting to see people living in 30 degree weather making giant woolly sweaters for Scandinavian wintertime. The whole idea of them being connected to a world that's not really their own, it's sort of, it's almost surreal on that.
we have everything we need in the Western world. We have everything we need in our wardrobe, in our home, etc. But what we do want to do is connect to a story. I think so many people want to do the right thing. We read about being green, we read about being sustainable, we read about being ethical. And this is a country that does so many of those things. And there is a story behind all these products. And there is a level of design that needs to be attached. We, I'm totally for less is more. We do not need to do a huge quantity. We just have to do a great product. As a school, we have a huge base of students, obviously. Students who are Tamil, Muslim, Sinhalese. So therefore, AOD has an opportunity to engage many different people with the, with the communities out there. It's very, very important for our students to take part in anything to do with the heritage, cultural aspects of Sri Lanka and um, the sustainable elements that we can bring into design. We are an international school. But at the same time, you want global students who are Sri Lankan. So working on creating a globalized contemporary style within a Sri Lankan context and building connections with real Sri Lankan artisans that our students can then get exposure to um, sort of is a best of both worlds kind of situation because they're taking the gifts their country have to offer design-wise and sort of reaching out into a broader world. Because she had some boxes and she cut them and took the bottom. And it has been quite interesting because we have been experimenting with a lot of dyes and a lot of weaves and trying to make new techniques of weaves, you know, working together. So it's it has been definitely hands-on experience. Like every day when we go back, we have dye all over our body, all on our clothes. So we don't get this sort of thing back home. It, it's been really good to get more closer to them and to get to know things they have gone through, uh, not emotionally, but also uh, to get to know their talent through all the problems and difficulties, uh, things they can do. We actually brief the students beforehand how to teach design to the community. For example, about respecting the community, about the community's past, being sensitive to the fact that they are after a war, so the barriers that that will pose, there would be things that they've been doing generation to generation. So our designers have to be sensitive to work with them, not just design and go and treat them like hand machine operators and just say produce. I think with anybody who's used to working on a limited line of things, they always have this feeling that you can't do more. So it's very empowering to have someone say, oh, you can, and we're going to and come here with me and we're going to do exactly what you think we can do. It teaches everybody involved in the project that things are possible as long as you stick to wanting to get what you wanted to get. We are coming with a very positive feel, if you like, design, art, that kind of area. Aid workers and all of that, they have been in a very critical situation where they haven't had time to spend time, get to know the people. I think we have been able to spend that time. So I think what I have found is from the time of going there, to the point of people afraid to even trust you. They really trust us now and that is a huge barrier. I think we've broken. I am astonished about their enthusiasm and the, the will um, to take on these projects and how they've engaged with our students and our designers that have been working with them. They want to learn, they're hungry to learn, they, they're passionate actually about what they're doing. They've been making the same basket for so many years and all of a sudden somebody brings them something and it's not the same colour and it's not the same size and it's a challenge to start off with but then at the end of it they manage to do it and you see their faces and that excitement in their eyes and you feel, wow, we've done it. Besides building the capacity for doing new work by changing product, we've built the capacity for doing new work by changing people and making them more interested in working with outsiders and seeing that you know there's a lot to exchange with people that are from very different backgrounds and places than them and that working with those people maybe isn't as daunting as they once thought it was.